we're on. Well, uh, welcome uh, students and everyone to uh, our Google Hangout for this week, which refers to the material uh, from uh, last week in the course on uh, communications and surveillance, uh, and of course the uh, spectacular dramatic leaks uh, of uh, Edward Snowden. And uh, with me today to discuss not the technical uh, aspects of the Snowden story in terms of surveillance, but the, um, the, the, the another big angle of that story is about the, the, the leaks and the national security reporting and the uh, classified information. So many of the things that we are, have studied in this class in some ways were made possible uh, to, for us to study uh, by reporters who uh, dug into issues and found out about them well before the government was uh, wanted to let the uh, public know and matter of fact may never have let the public know had it not uh, been for uh, the reporting on this issue. That said, uh, uh, when these issues become public, uh, that um, uh, does have an impact possibly on, on national security and the effectiveness uh, of the programs uh, themselves. And so that raises uh, some uh, very, very interesting ethical issues. And I'm incredibly privileged to have with me my uh, colleague and friend here at the Duke Sanford School, uh, former editor of the Washington Post, uh, worked on Frontline Magazine, and uh, just learned about some recent articles that he is writing, uh, my friend Phil Bennett. Uh, Phil, welcome and thank you for spending time with us this afternoon. Thank you, David. It's great to be here. Well, let's dive right into it. Um, uh, the government classifies information and uh, also makes it prime to tell anybody that does not have a security clearance and a real reason to know the information uh, to obtain that information. Yet, on the front page of most newspapers and uh, websites every day, there are probably stories uh, that uh, have classified information in them. Uh, how can that be? Uh, why Isn't it a crime uh, to be publishing that kind of information? Well, I don't know if it's because of uh, you said a keyword, uh, but uh, in the middle of that question, my screen went blank. <laughs> and, uh, oh. So I only heard part of it, but and now I only see you. And in the unmoving version. So you can see, hear and see me fine? Uh, I do. Uh, Justin, uh, hopefully we're still recording. Well, l let, me, let me take a, a whack at that. I mean, I think that you, you've raised the, the issue of the contradiction that's built into our system and that we wrestle with, uh, you know, with increasing frequency uh, for a couple of reasons that I'm, I'm sure we'll explore in this conversation. I mean, from a journalist's point of view, which is really the one I'm coming from in my experience and certainly my experience in dealing with um, official secrecy, um, uh, we have this magnificent framework, uh, uh, magnificent because it's been around since the founding of the Republic, uh, which is the constitutional framework for trying to understand the role of the press vis-a-vis -vis the government. And this an incredible... Um, element of our constitutional process, which is the First Amendment, which is quite uh, unique even in Western democracies, uh, uh, that, that um, protects the press, has been used to protect the press, and interpreted by courts to protect the press from, uh, from uh, it says in the First Amendment, from Congress, but really from uh, the government in determining what the press can or cannot uh, publish. And in practice, what this has done is created a loophole uh, for the news media in precisely the legal chain that you've described, which is um, it is, in fact, uh, illegal for a government uh, official or a spy or uh, an, an other people less well-defined to take government uh, secrets to control them, uh, as Edward Snowden did, because he actually physically held them, uh, and to uh, leak them uh, to the public. But once the leak has occurred, uh, then the legal picture becomes very hazy. Uh, and in fact, in the history of the United States, uh, no journalist uh, has ever been tried or convicted for publishing a secret. So, uh, so you have a contradiction and a tension that's built into our system um, quite remarkably and we see it playing out so much more often uh, today, uh, in part because we have uh, an aggressive uh, press in this area, but also because there's so many more secrets and so much more of national security 
is protected by uh, by secrecy, and much more of it's classified, uh, that uh, it's hard to even get into the area of counterinsurgency and counterterrorism without touching uh, classified uh, information. So the stakes of the game have um, have risen, and uh, and the and the frequency of conflicts uh, has has risen with them. Well, tell us if if the press was only reporting on non-classified information, uh, what would be the the impact in, on that in terms of our true understanding of how our our government is functioning? Because some would say the press just should not be doing this uh, at all. The government has made a decision. There are elected officials. Uh, they have a, a, a responsibility to the electorate to uh, protect national security. They have made the decisions as accountable officials that these activities should not be disclosed to the public. So oh, why is that the, a wrong answer? Well, I think it's, it, I think it's a wrong answer because it's so, I think it, it doesn't take on board all the elements that over time uh, uh, the electorate has shown to appreciate about democracy, which is the free flow of ideas. Um, but I don't think you even have to go there. I think you can start, and if you're a journalist, I'm not a constitutional scholar or a political philosopher. I'm trying to make concrete decisions about whether or not to publish uh, a secret. And so um, what I'm trying to answer for me is a question uh, that became very relevant in 9-11, and I, I think more relevant than it had been in previous uh, wars. And that question is, how do you hold the government accountable in a time of war? Um, does uh, the press and thereby the public uh, surrender uh, an outside? There are other people who hold the government accountable other than the media, clearly. But in our tradition, that's one of the roles that uh, the free press has played. Uh, so, uh, in the case of 9-11, uh, this became a new kind of question for two reasons, and I remember it in the Washington Post uh, actually as a very concrete dilemma for us. Um, after the attacks of 9-11, the government made clear and made explicitly clear, President Cheney, uh, Vice President Cheney, excuse me, uh, at a very well-known appearance on Meet the Press in the weeks after 9-11 in which he said that the war was going to be far, fought largely on the dark side, he said, meaning largely in secret, using secret means. And he also said that week in a separate interview that the war could last for the, it could last for the duration, uh, it could go on uh, for our lifetimes and beyond. So this presented a real dilemma to the press, which was to say, uh, either you are going to abstain from covering the war, and not just this week and next week, and not just this operation or that operation, but you were going to abstain from covering huge areas of the war that you've looked at in your class, detention uh, practices, uh, even um, uh, uh, decisions to go attack people in foreign countries that we weren't at war, we had not declared war against. So we were going to abstain from that coverage because it was all secret. But not only that, we were going to do it indefinitely. So there wasn't even uh, the probability that within a month or two months or some reasonable period you were going to be able to put that information in the public domain. So I think that there was a, just as there was a dilemma for policymakers after 9-11, how do we fight this new kind of war? There is a dilemma for the press, which is how do we cover this new kind of war, especially if so much of it is off limits. And I would ask, add just one other uh, point, uh, because I think you're, you're also asking something else in your question. If the secrecy uh, system were perfectly designed and executed, I think that the um, uh, a question about whether or not the press has any legitimacy in, in reporting secrets um, could be taken up in a more authentic way. But, as we know, the secrecy system is broken. And even advocates of secrecy, even people who work in secret fields, recognize that there are too many secrets. And this has been well documented, just the exponential growth of the number of secrets, on the one hand. And, on the other hand, the government's very loose practice of guarding secrets. So, for instance, I ask my students, how many of you know how Osama bin Laden was killed? 
And my students can account, can tell me in great detail the nature of that operation, who was on it, the name of the dog, Cairo, a number of details about that operation. That operation obviously was highly classified. That information came into the public domain not because uh, somebody broke the law by uh, telling a reporter. It came into the public domain because of authorized leaking by the government to tell a version of the story that it wanted the public to know. Secrets are published all the time in newspapers, they appear on the radio and on television. Only a very small number of those secrets were obtained in the way that, say, the Edward Snowden leak was obtained. The vast majority of them come from government officials telling journalists things in order to influence the public debate or maybe even their own self-image. And so these secrets uh, are, are put in play all the time and that's just part of the reality of our system and, and that's part of the atmosphere in which the press has to operate. So um, I know that you and really all responsible reporters understand that there actually are, there is information that it is uh, lives at stake or that the national security would be gravely harmed if they did appear on the front page of Frontline Magazine or the Washington Post. Uh, if uh, the, the reporter found out that the helicopters were in the air uh, on their way to a raid a compound in uh, northern Pakistan where uh, government believed Osama bin Laden was, uh, clearly if that uh, went on CNN uh, uh, that would have grave consequences. Uh, so how does the press then go about deciding which secrets can be published and, and, and when the government's actually uh, correct and something is properly kept out of the public eye? Yeah, I mean, it's another great question. So I, I think, first of all, it's worth recognizing that, uh, at least in my experience, and I, I think I can speak, you know, pretty authoritatively about it, um, uh, it's extremely rare. I, I can only think of one or two alleged uh, cases in which the press reported on an ongoing operation in a way that uh, put American or other lives at risk and did it knowingly. Um, so uh, usually secrets involve things that happened in the past. Usually the whole incident is over in some way. It's not an ongoing operation and it's certainly not a kind of military, op you know, helicopters in the air kind of operation. I will say parenthetically, and I think we'll get into this, Snowden, because of the nature of that leak, those were ongoing operations, so but of a different quality. But the kind that you're describing of revealing a military secret, a troop movement, a military plan um, in advance in a way that would have very measurable consequences. Um, uh, I can't think, there's only one example that people on the security side cite, which is a, a case involving Osama bin Laden's cell phone, and I won't get into it, but or satellite phone, but your students could look it up. It's also fraught with differences about how that was actually uh, leaked, and this was way before 9-11. Uh, um, but so, so I, I think it's important to recognize that most of the secrets that come uh, are not operational secrets, they're policy secrets. So they're a decision that the government has taken to pursue a policy. They've thrown a blanket of secrecy over the policy uh, and, uh, and they're doling out the pieces that they think are appropriate for public knowledge, which is of course uh, part of their responsibility, uh, but uh, uh, it, it keeps off limits a whole area of um, of uh, the government's activity. Um, I think, and, and, and this is a very important change uh, uh, that has happened in the last, yeah, I really think Snowden was a turning point. I think before then, it's certainly my experience at the Washington Post, uh, we tried to apply a process and criteria to deciding whether or not to publish secrets. And the process was a type of peer review that took place among people inside the newspaper uh, and occasionally people outside including our attorneys and others to talk about the implications of publishing something. But that process also included consulting with government officials and uh, telling them in advance that what well, our intention uh, to publish something and giving them the time uh, and the audience to 
argue against publication. Uh, and every example of a, of a significant secret uh, that I was involved in at the Washington Post involved consultation with people in the government telling them what we were going to publish and hearing their um, uh, reasons. Uh, some, they didn't always give them. Sometimes they would say, okay, fine, thank you very much, and they would not give us reasons, but occasionally they would say, here's uh, why we don't want you to publish this. And the, 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 those would usually be pretty general descriptions, right? Um, and in many of those cases, uh, uh, we uh, changed the story or we took out generally a very small detail uh, that, um, uh, uh, we, that we were asked to take out and that we didn't feel was essential to the story in order to accommodate those, uh, those concerns. Remember, when, you're, when you have a secret and you're a reporter, um, you have a piece of a puzzle. And you don't know what the puzzle even looks like sometimes. So you are very conscious of what you don't know. And so you're very careful and conscious about potential harm and risk. This is not um, an, an incidental sort of aspect for that pro of, of that process. And so in most of the cases I've been involved in, um, uh, things have been withheld, and in very famous ways, uh, you know, the New York Times withheld uh, the warrantless wiretapping program for a, over a year um, at the request of the government because the government at the level of the president uh, requested that they not publish that. Uh, so there is a give and take here within this contradiction that we've described. There's also uh, a, a has been uh, until now, generally, a give and take uh, over uh, the actual publication of the secret. So your criteria, the, there is an executive order uh, that uh, lays out a, a whole set of things that ought to be uh, classified. I'll just give one example, because I've been on the other side of the fence, because I've been, uh, as you know, a government lawyer uh, trying to defend uh, classification of certain materials against discovery requests or Freedom of Information Act requests. Mm -hmm. And uh, for example, one of them is, you know, generally a, a information relating to exchange of information between uh, uh, governments is generally all classified and the reasoning being is that even if it's fairly innocuous uh, information, uh, if the government can't trust us to uh, hold on to information, make sure it doesn't get on the front page of the Washington Post, that's going to damage the relationship and damage the likelihood that they're going to exchange information with us like that again. But that's an interest that the, the, uh, the press will rarely uh, acknowledge as being uh, a, a, a valid reason to uh, withhold uh, a story. Uh, so how do we reconcile, you know, uh, those kinds of interests where it's not necessarily about the tidbit of information that could be uh, released, but it's really about a relationship or a means of gaining information in the future that you can, are, are concerned would be damaged if you're in the government, which seems to me to be a legitimate reason for the government not to want that information to go out, but the press doesn't see it that way. So I would take issue uh, with your characterization of how the press sees it. So I have been in many, many, more than I can count, um, briefings, interviews, conversations with government officials around diplomatic issues specifically, in which they have said, um, what I'm about to tell you is off the record and I don't want you to use it, but I want you to know it to inform you about, uh, in a background sort of way about what we're trying to accomplish here. That's a, a very standard part of the relationship between sources and reporters, especially in the diplomatic area. And uh, those rules are almost never violated. Um, uh, and for a lot of reasons that you would uh, understand, you would never get invited back for that conversation. It's actually a trust issue. Uh, now, if somebody said, what I'm about to tell you, I don't want you to publish, and told you something that was an illegal act or uh, uh, revealed a lie that the government was telling to the, the, the then you might have a different circumstance, but that, I've never uh, seen that happen either. My point is that I don't think it is my experience, and I actually don't think the record shows this, that 
uh, when the press gets its hand on any tidbit, it shovels it into the public domain, uh, especially on the area of, uh, say, diplomatic uh, communications. Having left journalism or daily journalism now, I wish the press was more aggressive. I wish uh, we knew more about what we were telling our allies about ISIS. I wish we knew much more about um, what we're doing in cyber areas vis-a-vis -vis China. Because I think these are in the public interest, and like, I think the government does a very bad job uh, in those two specific areas in laying out to the American public things that would not endanger the national security. Because remember, to be top secret, it has to cause uh, you know, severe harm grave damage to the national security of the United States, right? Can't just be embarrassing, uh, can't make you look bad, can't be a failure you're trying to cover up. Uh, it has to uh, meet that standard. So I, I, I would say two things. I, I'd say that I don't think that uh, the press is on um, an Easter egg hunt uh, to, to unearth any little uh, trinket and uh, put it in the, in the public domain. Uh, and I think um, that uh, some of the things that uh, the government affixes the classified uh, information label to um, uh, have a very tenuous purchase on that uh, label. But I was just saying one other thing that I think where you're headed, or I wonder where you're headed with this, is to Bradley Manning, the diplomatic cables, and, and that then we, we get into another area there. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, let's um, let's move to this question of the sources because in the Supreme Court cases, one of the reasons they say, well, you know, they, we're not going to prosecute the reporters after all; they're essentially First Amendment actors. But the government always has the power to to punish the source themselves, the person who's promised to uh, uh, hold that information uh, uh, away from people who aren't supposed to have it. That's always an avenue open, therefore we can allow this kind of loophole, as you said, uh, with respect to the First Amendment. Yet, reporters uh, say that the, when the government you know, aggressively tries to prosecute the, the, the leaker, that that's infringing on their uh, First Amendment responsibilities too, because that, that, that kind of intimidation is going to essentially dry up sources and make it much more difficult for this, what, what you describe totally accurately is an important accountability function of, of the press. So there's another incredible tension is that uh, the national security reporter to do their job is relying on other people who, at least in some instances, they know uh, have decided to break the law. I think that this is a tension that's one of the, the most important and richest in our political system. Uh, and I think it's a, a, you know, if you're in it as you've been and uh, I've been perhaps on in wearing different uniforms, uh, it's, uh, its resolution is incredibly important. Um, I, I, you know, I take the view and uh, again, I try not to keep, I, I think it's important because just as for policymakers, for journalists, it's really the practical decision that matters. It's useful to have a philosophical framework uh, in which to see it, but it really is sort of what are you going to do in the end. Philosophically, I feel that the free flow of information is good for democracy. Uh, and I also feel that uh, uh, self-governing people have to have the means to self-govern, and that, the, you know, that, that exists since the Federalist Papers. And so... Um, uh, and so what are the mechanisms we have to inform the public about what the government's doing in a way that, uh, that ultimately contributes to the legitimacy of that government? And the press is one arm of that. The problem for me of prosecuting leakers the way that the administration has done them, I and of course the Obama administration has, has um, charged more uh, leakers under the Espionage Act than all, uh, previous, pre all previous administrations combined, Okay. Um, the problem with it is it's a very blunt instrument to deal with what is a huge problem. It's really trying to solve global warming by shutting down a few factories um, uh, because the government leaks like crazy. And leaking performs actually a very important function in our democracy. There have been a lot of beneficial leaks that have explained uh, policies or have created, opened up dissent channels that were important. Wouldn't it have been uh, in the interests of the country 
if a leaker would have emerged in early 2003 to say, you know what, we actually don't have any uh, uh, solid intelligence about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. That person might have been breaking the law, but they would have been doing a service to the country. Uh, so I don't think that those things are, you can, you can simply dismiss those by uh, recurring to the rules. Um, you know, our system is a, is a system built on laws, but it's also built on, on a, a very flexible uh, interaction and flow of information among different parties. And uh, when so much of that information is tied up uh, in secrecy, where we have, we have five million people in the country with top secret uh, clearances uh, or secret clearances, uh, all doing the business of the government every day in a big black box that the public cannot peer into uh, easily. So I think that's, but I think the tension you're describing is, is very real and very important. Because, you know, people would say that, well, if people can consistently leak with impunity and uh, in some ways become uh, global celebrities uh, based on uh, their leaking without being punished in any regard, that's just going to encourage more and more people to try to uh, reveal more and more secrets and the system would, would fall apart if you never prosecuted one of these uh, sources. Right. And, and I, 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 you know, I understand that argument. Um, and I think that there is a certain logic to it. I would say, again, from where I sit, that um, the, the size of what we don't know is so much bigger than what we know. And, um, uh, and we could go around the world and talk about counterterrorism operations uh, and policies, not just individual sort of, you know, let's go rescue a hostage, uh, but real uh, strategic policy decisions uh, that do not get aired before the public, which means a couple of things. It means that, for instance, it's very easy to create inaccurate narratives about who lost the Iraq war or what to do about ISIS or how effective the airstrikes are because there's not a, a, a very effective mechanism for airing those things out. I guess that, that, that I think, but I think that, yes, an, a, an uncontrolled system of leaking uh, well, I would turn it around and say it this way. I think that everybody, including almost everybody I know in the press, uh, believes that there are legitimate secrets um, and that countries have used secrets uh, since the beginning of nation states to guard and protect their interests. That they, secrets, too, are, the, are part of the grease that moves the wheels of diplomacy, as you described, and makes military operations uh, possible uh, and uh, and are a legitimate part of that process. You know, we had an in invasion of Iraq. Uh, we had um, 26 uh, journalists from the Washington Post embedded with U.S. troops, uh, immersed in the secrecy of those operations. And even though there were eventually thousands of journalists uh, uh, embedded with American troops, I can't think of a single episode in which uh, any of them uh, revealed a secret that uh, that was um, indicated to have caused damage to any military operation. So, on the other hand, yes, in theory that would be terrible. In practice, is that what is that what would happen? I think less clear. Uh, an interesting uh, one of these uh, issues and leaks that I, I think about uh, often. As a matter of fact, we had Bob Woodward here not too many years ago. Uh, was the question of um, Stanley McChrystal's recommendation to the president on uh, Afghanistan uh, strategy. And somebody leaked that uh, uh, document uh, to the Washington Post and uh, uh, it put the whole issue a much, you know, framed the issue in a much different way in the, in the, in the media. And uh, so the media in some way was was being used uh, with a strategic leak to influence the, the policy debate that I think in many ways uh, put uh, President uh, Obama in, in a box. That was supposed to be a, a confidential communication between an advisor and a, um, uh, uh, and a superior. Um, you know, does the press worry about how, and I guess this is in the non-classified realm, it, it happens as well, but in some ways, 
being party to a strategy to uh, influence a certain outcome on a, uh, on a policy issue uh, because Absolutely. of the leaking of a classified document. Yeah, I mean, I think that that probably was a classified document. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, you know, um, is the press used? Uh, yeah. <laughs> the answer to that question is yes. <laughs> um, uh, you know, used with gusto every day by as many people who can figure out a way to do it. So being used is a, um, you know, a, yes, it's a big concern. Uh, you know, the Bush administration used the press to sell uh, their argument about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq uh, prior to the invasion, and some of the best reporters I know, including the one you just mentioned, um, uh, contributed to that effort. Uh, and uh, obviously not with the intention of backing the government, uh, but because what they were being leaked were good, compelling stories from very high, incredible sources. And uh, unfortunately, one of the things that secrecy creates is an inability to really report against whatever information you're getting. You're a captive audience when you're being leaked uh, a secret often. Um, and so the risk of being used uh, goes, up, uh, goes up exponentially. So how do you guard against that? You know, I think that uh, you try to do as much reporting as you can. I wonder, it, the, the McChrystal memo is a good, uh, would be a good case study to see, I have no, there's no doubt in my mind, I, I did not make that decision to publish uh, that. I wasn't at the Washington Post when that happened. As a reader, um, uh, if I, um, excuse me, if I were handed that memo, I wouldn't have a lot of doubt about whether or not it was in the public interest to see it. Um, but I would try to then uh, do that in a way that minimized not the harm of that memo. When I say that, I'm not describing a world that is neat or nice or that I'm even comfortable with. But I'm describing a world, uh, a world as it is, and this is really important to keep in mind in this conversation. Your job in the press, if you are handed something, then your decision is not, do I hand it back? Your decision is, am I going to stand in the way of the public knowing this thing? And sometimes you will say, yes, I will. And for a lot of reasons, not just secrecy, privacy, decency, a number of, of factors can weigh in that. But if Edward Snowden comes to you and hands you, uh, you know, millions of documents, then your decision is not, boy, was, was that a good thing for him to have done? Okay, like, in fact, that's sort of irrelevant to you in your role, to your principal role, I would say, which is to decide, should the public know these things or not? And if not, I better have a really good reason because I need a much bigger reason for them not to know them than I do for them to know them. So, uh, and, and so I think that that's the that, that, those are the dilemmas that cr get created by a by a McChrystal uh, leak or the or the hundreds of leaks that occur every day uh, in Washington uh, to try to gain advantage in the policy process. Uh, let's David? just turn to the Snowden story. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. I have a question from a student that's been posed that might fit well here, if I can ask it. On Absolutely. Our behalf. We've got Brenda Andrews who's asking, what stops people like Snowden? You froze up, Justin. Traditional media outlets. And how does that change? how you choose to cover stories at that point. I only got a bit of that, Justin. Justin, yeah, you, you broke up uh, in the middle of the question. Could you uh, pose it again or, or type it on the side of the screen? Sure, I'll try again. What stops people like Edward Snowden from releasing their information directly through social media, like blogs, Twitter, or Facebook, without the help of traditional media outlets? How does that change the role and responsibility of the traditional media? 
So is that from Brenda or Bre yes, from Brenda? Yeah. Well, I, I think I, Brenda. That's a gr you know that in some ways that's the key question because what happens in Snowden is several things collide. Um, uh, the growth of the networks we're all on, uh, which is um, uh, you know the, which is the subject of both his leak and the dissemination of his leak. Uh, uh, this world of secrecy that's grown so much that we see, the asymmetrical threats posed by people, which is one of the reasons the policies that uh, he's revealing were uh, enacted, and the changing role of the news media. So, um, you know, when Daniel Ellsberg made the Pentagon Papers, uh, he carried them around trying to get somebody to publish them. He first went to Congress, actually, and said, could you read these into the congressional record? And they said no. And then he went to uh, uh, a think tank and said, could you publish it? And they said no. So finally he goes to the New York Times, and uh, they spend three months reading the Pentagon Papers before they decide we're going to publish this part, and then we're not going to publish this part. Uh, and they became the gatekeepers for that uh, process. So you can see the obvious differences with Snowden. If uh, Glenn Gr Greenwald or Bart Gelman decide, or The Guardian or The Washington Post decide, uh, that this is too hot to handle, or this is a legitimate, as far as we can see and measure, uh, these are secrets that we don't feel comfortable publishing because we think they're legitimate secrets and they're, or they're not in the public interest. Well, he can, he can self-publish. He can self-publish. And so uh, that does change the calculus. The Snowden uh, leak has so many idiosyncrasies attached to it, and Edward Snowden had an incentive to go through the traditional media, um, but Bradley Manning d uh, did not. So uh, he sent his to Julian Assange, and that created a different uh, dynamic. So the gatekeeper role, you know, I'm the editor, and I will decide what you see or don't see, that, that era is plainly over. Um, uh, so, uh, and it, it, it does, what, what I would argue is, that doesn't relieve those institutions of their responsibility in trying to determine what's in the public interest to know, because they still have incredible influence, uh, and because uh, uh, we can't um, take our constitutional privileges seriously unless we take our constitutional responsibilities seriously, even if technology has made some of those uh, obsolete. Uh, which it clearly has. Um, there's another wrinkle in, in Brenda's question too, which is um, it used to be uh, that uh, my decision to publish existed only in the realm of the distribution of my publication. Uh, that's obviously not true anymore. So that if I decide not to publish something, so I decide that uh, publishing uh, intervention into Angela Merkel's cell phone uh, is really not in the public interest uh, to know. And parenthetically, I do think it was in the public interest to know, but put that aside. And Der Spiegel publishes it. And then I'm at the Washington Post. Do I continue not to publish that, even though it's already in the public domain? Or do I fold my cards and say, let's be adults and, uh, and recognize that something is on every television station in the country? I'm going to stop ignoring it. This is a real problem. It's a, it's a very big dilemma, and I don't think it's trivial. Yeah, so many uh, questions. You know, I'm, a, um, I'm not a big Snowden fan, but in some ways I think you have to give him credit for going the um, journalist route rather than the uh, WikiLeaks uh, route, because in some ways it shows he recognized he was not really well equipped to uh, uh, make those decisions about what should be in the public domain and what should not. We don't know if he held on to copies and he was going to, you know, if they didn't publish certain things, he don't really know the answer to that. But in some regards, I give him credit for understanding that journalists were much better equipped to make that, those kind of calls than he was. Well, I think that that's a good, that's a fair point. Uh, you know, I think that in that realm, what Snowden did, which was a real um, help to the kinds of questions that we're talking about, is that he revealed himself. And 
I don't think that this has been commented on enough. If Snowden had remained an anonymous source, as Daniel Ellsberg did uh, until he was quickly found out, he would have triggered a First Amendment crisis in this country because people would have wanted to seek uh, the identity of that source. And I think that would have been a very difficult First Amendment case for the press. And um, by revealing himself, in other words, uh, uh, there would have been enormous pressure on both the individual reporters who remember both Glenn Greenwald and Bart Gelman were basically freelancers, even though they were affiliated with respective newspapers. Uh, they were sort of outsiders, and they, they, were, they were more vulnerable, I think, uh, than, um, than they would have been uh, in a more traditional setting. But they and those publications would have been under enormous pressure to identify the source of these documents. Uh, and that, and uh, I think the First Amendment is such a precious instrument for the freedom of uh, information in this country uh, that uh, not having to go through that crisis uh, was uh, important. With the Snowden story, another, you know, so many angles, but another really important one in my mind is kind of this difference between nationality and, and being a, a global citizen. Uh, and what I mean by that is if you look at the Snowden leaks, I think the ones that are the most defensible uh, and the most difficult to prosecute him for in some ways are the, the ones he did about the, the cell phone call data database in the United States. Uh, you had had people testify that such a database, or it could be interpreted they were testifying that such a database didn't exist. Uh, it was a dubious uh, legality, not that Snowden was really well equipped to make those decisions himself, but at least one uh, federal judge has <laughs> come to that same uh, conclusion. A lot are on the other side, but uh, it was certainly of much more marginal uh, legality. Uh, and it, it related specifically to uh, the government, U.S. government's relationship with its own citizens. Almost all the other leaks relate to spying activities outside the United States, uh, and what spying is, is violating the laws, almost by definition, is violating the laws of other countries in order to gain information that our government believes is going to help uh, it either protect security or perform some of its other uh, functions. Um, and I guess the question then is for, I guess, for a journalist, do you look at this public interest question as a public interest of the world and of the citizens of the world to know this information? Or do you look at it from the perspective of an American citizen, which you are, or the Washington Post is an American organization, and exists in, in the United States, its readers are American citizens, is it in the interest of the United States for the world to know a certain quantum of information? Yeah, wow, I mean that's, that, that's, that's a big question. I, I mean you're, this is sort of where, uh, and, and by that I mean if I, I won't try to deconstruct your question, but it, I guess I come at it without such a bright line. I think it's increasingly difficult to draw bright lines between what is domestic and what is global. And I'll give you an example. Well, the Angela Merkel example. Okay. Was let me start at a, okay, let me start, okay, let's go, we'll go to that. Let, let's start at a, uh, I'll, I'll move to the Angela Merkel thing quickly, but uh, look at the second, so Snowden revealed two programs uh, two huge programs which reflected uh, the massive collection of data uh, from people. And really the Snowden leak was about moving from targeted collection to mass collection of data. And the first was the one that you referenced, which was the Verizon, that the government had uh, collected all the metadata from all the calls in the United States uh, over Verizon and probably other uh, telephone uh, networks. But the second was PRISM which was um, nine internet companies and getting into their systems to uh, ostensibly get foreign communications that were coming through uh, U.S. internet companies. The students but, had two good uh, presentations on both those programs, so they should ought to be so you know, Yes, so you know that there was a lot of what they called incidental collection of U.S. persons uh, in that, 
Uh, so it was a it was a very big dragnet, and we also know that because of their three hops that they could take, they could very quickly build from a foreign collection into a domestic uh, area. We also know that what they did. So if the United States is going and saying we're not going to hack into Google's uh, data links in the United States because that might be illegal, but we we, we can go do it overseas. It's a U.S. company, right? Is it, we can still do it overseas, and it'll still fall under the statute. So those are there. Even in that is an expression of the grayness that surrounds this. That doesn't say, oh, you know, it's domestic or it's it's international. And I think that's why I said one of the things that the Snowden case brings up is the fact that um, citizens, terrorists, governments, everybody's living on the same series of networks, right? And so it's very difficult to disaggregate all of the actors who are present or have interests there. And I think that applies to domestic and international as well. Now you're raising the issue of um, individual spying operations that fall very much inside the lines of traditional espionage, uh, which is basically listening to people and, sp and trying to figure out what they're doing in a way that can improve uh, your national, uh, or could serve your national interest. So, wow, that is a, that is a very difficult area. In the 1970s, the Washington Post discovered, uh, uh, involved Bob Woodward again, that the United States had placed a tap on the undersea cable. They'd use a submarine to go down and place on the undersea cable that the Soviet Union was using to send encrypted messages between uh, under the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and uh, they were able, for many for some period to exploit that, so they could listen in on the Soviet Union. The Washington Post learned this, and the Washington Post did not publish it for a long time. They only published it after NBC News broke it, and then they discovered the government had not been truthful with them, and the program had been discovered by the Soviets a long time ago and had been dismantled, so it wasn't even active anymore. But it shows you how sensitive the press was to secrets about sources and methods uh, and, um, uh, and about things like, um, you know, what you would say, gee, you know, I've discovered that the CIA spies on people. And you'd think, well, what did you think that they were doing? So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think that that's, um, I think that those are legitimate uh, questions. I think that the, Mer the Merkel thing, the, the, you know, the Merkel story, which again, I, I, I sort of go back to my corner in the red trunks because I think it's a great story. I mean, it's really interesting. It tells you how the government works. They were spying on their closest ally or one of their closest allies, certainly in continental Europe. It's come out subsequently that many of her other neighbors' countries were, were spying on the exact same thing. And, of course, the German intelligence uh, service has had to admit that it spies on other foreign leaders uh, in its own neighborhood. So I, I'm sure there are people. I wouldn't make this argument because it's not doesn't fall to me to make it. But some people could say, well, that's good to know. <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't know. Um, I think that um, I think that that's a tough call. I, you know, I think it's a tougher call about well, what about spying on someone who's not as close an ally. Uh, and there were cases of those too. Um, what about uh, you know um, you know I I, I think that. You're, 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 I think, quite rightly pointing to a path of, of, um, of an area of legitimate disagreement among people of what's in the public interest to know and what is not. And I, I would say that you know, I, I, I tend to be a, a maximalist on the rights question, the right to publish it, the, the um, the, the benefit of, of transparency, but I'm so I'm much more conservative on the individual cases. I think they need to be looked at uh, very carefully, individually, uh, and that has been a challenge with Snowden because of the not only the great volume of documents, but because it's a competitive story between two news organizations. 
and that if you don't do the Merkel story, the other guy is going to do it, and then you're going to have to do it anyway. Uh, so I and I don't think that those things that gets into the sort of the you know we don't like to look at that. It's not it's not a very high flying uh, principle, but boy, you know that's there. And and boy, the Washington Post really wanted to get its hands on the Pentagon Papers once they'd been published in the New York Times. I mean that. You know that, and that—that's not an insignificant force driving the flow of information. Or uh, that you know these are our corporations that have a number of interests other than making sure the public knows what it should know, uh, and and they are given by the Constitution some of this, uh, uh, in, in essence, uh, an opportunity to draw the line as to what becomes classified and 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 what does not. Uh, let me, uh, I think, well, you've David, been probably generous with your time. Oh, you have one more, another question, I've Justin. I've got one more from a student that right. I, I'd like to add in here from Paul um, Tyrinius. And he's asking about maybe a different angle about the purpose that journalists serve. And he wants to know, uh, doesn't the public need somebody to interpret uh, documents, so what, like uh, journalists? If they're read as is, for example, if Snowden had just mass uh, dispersed all of his information that he had to the public in social media or something like that, wouldn't some of the meaning get lost in all of the information? Like maybe you wouldn't actually read that kind of information. Does the leaker need the journalist to make that understandable, to make it uh, digestible by the public? Well, you won't be surprised to know that I would argue yes, um, and 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 I think more than self-interest is involved. I mean, I think I think there's wide recognition of that. You know, Julian Assange went to the New York Times and to the Guardian and to other papers later, uh, even though he considered himself a journalist and and he possessed the means of publication himself. What he didn't possess was a means. He didn't have the platform, but even more than that, he didn't have the ways of managing and interpreting and synthesizing those documents the way those news organizations did. And I think that the proof was in what was actually revealed about them. And if you go and look at the WikiLeaks documents, many of them, they're sort of indecipherable. You really can't, as a citizen, go in there and make a lot of use out of, out of that. And that, that's the same with Snowden. I mean, those documents, those programs that, that Edward Snowden revealed were very complex. Um, they have a lot of elements in them that if you look at those PowerPoint slides, they're hard to deconstruct. So you needed some guide uh, through them. Um, you know, that is, um, and, and I think that, so I think raising that, it's a, it's a very important question that's been raised. What we've been talking about mostly for the, through this hour is just the act of revelation. And um, uh, so, um, and I think on another higher plane exists this explanation, which ultimately, if it's going, if a leak or a, a publication of a secret is going to fulfill its highest purpose, it's going to be to inform citizens about the activities of their government. And you can only do that if it's if it makes sense, and it's not subject to subsequent manipulation. You know, one of my, you know, I mentioned the Bin Laden raid earlier. I mean, I, I still think it's amazing to me that um, we have an image of what happened. I mean, that was a very important operation. Now, maybe it didn't change the course, it didn't introduce an era of world peace, and maybe strategically it was of limited value, but it was an important moment in American history, given the antecedents. And yet, we still don't know really what happened. We were told a story uh, uh, that involved a lot of classified information. We weren't able to interrogate those facts. So we really don't know what the government knows about uh, bin Laden. And the government did something that even seemed worse to me, which was they then laundered part of those secrets and through a Hollywood movie that they gave access to certain uh, elements of that story to. Um, it, 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 in a way, burnished the version that they had originally put out. Uh, now, that may seem sort of innocuous. It's all entertainment. or it, it, But I think that those are... Those are important things in a democracy. You know, when important things happen, there ought to be an, a, an ability, some ability to interrogate the facts. And uh, when, that, when that doesn't happen, uh, I think we lose something. Phil, I'm gonna, uh, you've been incredibly generous with your time. I'm going to ask you a question you might not feel well equipped to answer. But I'm going uh, to ask it anyway. 
there's really not a single actor in uh, this arena, uh, whether it be an academic, a practicing journalist, or people even in government, who don't start out when they say this, that we have too many secrets, we don't do a very good job uh, in that system. And because of that, what we end up with is this really almost, uh, it just Rube, Rube Goldberg-esque kind of system of uh, the, the press trying to get information that it thinks it's in the public interest, the government trying to stop it, a, a, a nice dance when the information becomes uh, 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 in the possession of the press where the, there's this back and forth uh, dialogue, then you have the whole question of, the leaker themselves and the selective prosecution, all of which breeds mistrust by the press and the desire to, you know, get more information that the government is trying to uh, protect. It's really, uh, uh, you wouldn't draw it up like this, uh, I don't think. It's, it has evolved uh, to this point. Is there some process, that my, so my question, my long-winded uh, introduction to this question, is, do you have any thoughts about how we could do a better job than we do of, uh, uh, of the government defining what ought to be a secret and, and, and what not, uh, that maybe that could be, then the, this whole other system might be a little less messy and, and arbitrary. So, um, yeah, well, uh, I'll, I'll cut to the chase and say I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I think I would direct the students to go back uh, and look at uh, newly elected President Obama's, you know, his first act in office was to declare a new era of government transparency. His first, the first order that he signed on the day after his inauguration, the afternoon of his inauguration, was one that, uh, so he put that at a very high uh, place. Uh, if you go look at a speech that the President gave at the National Archives in the spring after his inauguration, basically saying, my government will be the most transparent in history, including speeding the declassification, because we're talking about things that are happening now that are secret. The United States has, has mountains of secret documents about things that have happened over the last, you know, during the Cold War period that can't be made uh, open to the public. So huge issue. The president made it a priority, and I think it's fair to say that that, that effort has failed and failed you know, not because of the fault of uh, the Obama administration alone, but it's failed miserably. And we have in the country now, I think, a scandalous uh, situation about secrecy. Why? Not just because it's uh, uh, not telling us about secret operations that the government might be conducting overseas, but because um, uh, it is part of the commercial fabric of a multi-billion dollar business to furnish the defense and intelligence uh, agencies uh, with, um, you know, uh, all sorts of things at all sorts of costs that the public never gets to see and vet. And in some cases, the public's representatives don't see them either. So I, I think that this is a, a problem that goes beyond just uh, knowing everything that the government's doing, which I think is unrealistic uh, hope. Uh, but I think it, it's actively damaging uh, the government by allowing um, a you know a, a secrecy industrial complex. I don't think it's too dramatic to say that uh, to have grown in the country. And there are many many examples of this. When I was at Frontline, and we did a film called Top Secret America. I recommend it to your students if they're interested. To just it tries to take the measure of this secret world that has uh, grown. And the final thing I'll say, David, is that. From where I sat and, and in my life as a journalist still, um, uh, you know, I'm not a Marxist, uh, but I believe in certain dialectic uh, things are good and, and real and inevitable. And, um, and I think the dialectic between, um, you know, openness and control between um, attention in our democracy between different interests. Um, it is not always something bad uh, that needs to be solved. I think that those tensions are part of what constrains power. And if our entire system is built around the idea of constraining power, we still want power. We want a government that's going to defend us and represent our interests, but we want to constrain that power. And part of what we've been talking about today is a, is a 
it, it is messy, and it's, it's, it also leaves a bitter taste in the mouth many times. Uh, but it's a big exercise in both the exercise and constraint uh, of power. And, and that's why I think it, it, it's actually fascinating to look at, but it's also important to appreciate. Well, Phil, uh, I, I, I knew that I wanted my students to be exposed to you and your ideas and your experience because to tell the story of 9-11 and not uh, get involved in this particular issue, uh, and you've explained it both at the nitty-gritty details but also at a very high level, you know, would be to not tell really the whole uh, story. And uh, you're the most articulate person I know who uh, can talk about these things in that way, and uh, I'm so grateful for you to spend your time and share uh, your thoughts uh, with all of us. So uh, many, many thanks on behalf of uh, myself and, and all of the students who will watch this uh, video. Well, thanks for the invitation, and good luck with the rest of the course. Okay. See ya.